Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Use the link in the description and code MIDNIGHT to get 50% off one item and free shipping in the US and Canada. Some exclusions apply. As we get farther and farther from the film industry as it existed in 1999, I've really come to appreciate Steven Sommer's The Mummy more than I ever did in the 2000s. As a kid, while I did think it was really entertaining, it always lived in the shadow of Indiana Jones for me. And while that's not exactly wrong, it's a genre that I've now seen done so poorly so often from the deathly boring Tomb Raider reboot to last year's Jungle Cruise. Being able to pull off one of these old-fashioned film serial-inspired movies is something that eludes so many studios today, whereas The Mummy pulled it off in a way that still holds up surprisingly well, even with more dated CGI than your average franchise. So that's what I wanted to dig into this week, why 1999's The Mummy works so well, and why Universal has badly failed the series ever since. Before I get into that though, I should probably acknowledge the obvious here. The 1999 movie is far from where The Mummy got its start on the big screen. This video will not be about the 1932 Mummy movie, or all of the semi-sequels and reimaginings that Universal made mostly in the first half of the 20th century and that died off after Abbott and Costello meet the Mummy. There's a lot of really solid and interesting filmmaking there, but I think both that era and the Hammer Horror Mummy films would require separate videos because they're all so distinct from each other. What I want to hone in on here is when The Mummy transitioned into being a full-blown action-adventure series, movies that are pulling far more from Steven Spielberg than Boris Karloff. I think the Tom Cruise movie also falls into that category, even if it's doing a much worse job. So those are the four films that I'm really going to focus in on, because I think their evolution, or maybe de-evolution, gives us an interesting look at how the industry has changed since the late 90s. Oh, and I'm also not really going to touch on The Scorpion King at all here because it's inspired so many sequels that have nothing to do with The Mummy at all. And there's no way I'm talking Scorpion King unless I can also sit down and actually watch Scorpion King 4 Quest for Power. Apparently Lou Ferrigno is in that one. Anyway, we're talking mummies here, so let's just get into The Mummy. <laughs> This is a movie you would not expect to work nearly as well as it does. The filmmaker, Steven Somers, had never really directed a real action movie before. He was mostly known for family-friendly Disney fare, like 1993's The Adventure of Huck Finn. That solid, if kind of bland adaptation that starred Elijah Wood, that you may have rented in middle school because there was a book report due tomorrow and you didn't actually make it past the second chapter of the novel. It also starred someone known for his really broad comedic acting, in things like George of the Jungle, Airheads, and Encino Man. But what they both deliver in The Mummy draws on everything they'd done well in the past and then builds on it. Brendan Fraser is really funny as Rick O'Connell. The character can be bumbling and clueless, but he's not a punchline. Fraser is really able to step into the role of a charismatic action hero too. Rick may not always know what he's doing, but that's part of why it's so fun to watch him throw caution to the wind and make everything up as he goes along. And Somers may not be the best action director ever, I think he leans a bit too much on the CG creatures that haven't really stood the test of time, but he has a really nice eye for period details, having made literary adaptations like Huck Finn and the 90s live action Jungle Book. The world of The Mummy has these great sets and grand locations that feel believable and lived in, much like Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it's such a breath of fresh air when you watch a movie like Jungle Cruise or even Red Notice, where so much of it feels like they're just standing in front of a green screen and not even attempting to hide that. I respect computer generated effects and I think a lot of these companies do great work, but it often feels like they're just being leaned on far too much. They're being asked to create these sets after the fact that just have a hard time matching the atmosphere that a big old fashioned studio set and some matte paintings can give you. CG can obviously be used to make creatures that look far better than they do in this movie, but so much of the actual setting just looks and feels a lot more compelling here. And of course, no conversation about The Mummy is complete without acknowledging the great chemistry between Fraser and Rachel Weisz. Weisz's Evelyn is one of those roles that could have easily been thankless and forgettable. The underwritten love interest who rolls her eyes at all the fun stuff that Rick does. We know exactly how boring that can be. I mean, just look at Jurassic World. Thankfully, that's not the case here. 
Evelyn is the smart librarian, but she's also goofy, clueless, and charming in many of the same ways that Rick is. And she gets a lot more to do than just spout exposition and frown, going toe to toe with Rick in fun lines and memorable comedic moments. There's a lot of self aware comedic banter in movies these days, and some of it I really enjoy, like Thor Ragnarok, while other times it just falls flat on its face. But the comedic energy between Rick and Evelyn feels like it's rooted in a far older tradition than that, bringing to mind 30 screwball comedies like it happened one night, where both leads can be clever, flirtatious, and a little clueless all at the same time. These two are the foundation of the movie, but the rest of the cast is great too. Like I really love seeing John Hanna, who was just incredibly underrated for two seasons on Star's Spartacus as Evelyn's bumbling brother. There is a very thin line between funny and obnoxious with comedy relief characters like this, and Hannah has the skills as an actor to almost always stay on the right side of that line. Amazingly, even in the sequels, where the material they give him gets much, much worse. So while the movie has its flaws, like, I don't think I could ever get very invested in the mummy mythology that this movie features a lot of, it is one of those cable classics that'll happily put on any time. Summers and Universal kind of pulled off the impossible here. They made an Indiana Jones-like movie that I would actually put in the same conversation as those first three indie films. I wish I could say that they continued on that path too, that they created more films in the series that are as good or even better than the first, but I just don't think that's the case. What's the best sequel to the 1999 Mummy? Honestly, the indoor roller coaster Revenge of the Mummy at Universal Studios. That thing is a classic that they need to preserve forever. The actual sequels though, the nicest thing I can say about them is that each one makes me appreciate the one before it a little bit more. The Mummy Returns is a flat, bloated mess compared to the first film. The script has so much less energy, the action beats are worse, and they have Rick and Evie settle into married life so quickly that it kind of feels like a missed opportunity. But it actually looks pretty good compared to Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. Gonna be honest, until re-watching it for this video, I mainly remembered this movie for its truly horrendous Wii tie-in game. But going back to the actual film really didn't do it any favors. Weiss is out of the picture here, recast with Mario Bello, who is totally fine in this movie by the way. But here's the thing, this film came out in 2008, less than 10 years after the first, but they've decided that Rick and Evelyn are like an elderly married couple. That sounds like an exaggeration, but I don't think it is. This movie features a lot of Rick trying to connect with his fully grown, very whiny adult son Alex, and it's completely ridiculous honestly, this guy has like no screen presence. I don't want to blame the actor, maybe he's great in other stuff, but he's so boring here, and he has to play these whiny scenes with Fraser as his dad, despite only being 13 years younger than him. It weirdly mirrors Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, where Shia LaBeouf is on whiny son duty. But this guy makes Mutt Williams look like, well, Indiana Jones in comparison. And whereas that at least made sense because Harrison Ford was definitely a bona fide elderly man in 2008, Brendan Fraser does not look old in this movie. Now the more I looked into this, the more I found that there was an actual reason for this bizarre setup. Fraser told GQ in 2018 that he spent the seven years after shooting The Mummy going in and out of the hospital, as injuries he sustained on set really piled up, saying, by the time I did the third mummy picture in China, I was put together with tape and ice. This probably explains why so many of the action scenes in the movie are given to the character's son. So I at least understand now what they needed to work around, but it still feels like maybe the worst way they could have done it. It's also not helped by the fact that the film really wastes Jet Li as the villain, an actor who was also leaving his difficult stunts phase behind, and who looks like a PS3 character for most of the movie. I think the setting and the choice to tackle Chinese mythology was a really solid one, but it just doesn't come together here at all, not helped by the fact that stealth director Rob Cohen took over from Somers and delivers a much worse looking movie. It's watchable enough, but it definitely feels like The Mummy was running on fumes just nine years after the success of that first reboot. Speaking of reboots, let's talk about the most recent entry in the franchise, just called The Mummy in 2017. 
It was the second movie of Universal's Dark Universe. If you count Dracula Untold, which I guess you should, it's a little confusing and the Dracula Untold connection is really tacked on, but point is, this was supposed to represent a new phase in The Mummy. No more standalone sequels. This was a huge A-list production that was going to turn The Mummy into the Iron Man of the DU. And as you all know, it worked perfectly. The character of Nick Morton is a beloved icon, and we're all excited to see The Mummy Age of Dracul when it opens in December. Okay, maybe none of that happened, but why not? I mean, The Mummy has proved itself as a viable action series. Tom Cruise, whatever else you feel about the guy, is a very consistent action star. If the movie was up to the standards of the last few Mission Impossible films, I could see it being a big hit. But obviously it's not. Tom Cruise unfortunately signed on to a terrible script here, which doesn't even deliver much of the exciting stunt work that he's now known for. You know that business term minimum viable product, like the threshold of features that some tech product needs to have to meet the bare minimum of what consumers will accept? The Mummy 2017 is kind of like that concept as a movie. I mean, they even had to patch their first trailer. <laughs> it's probably what the film is now most remembered for where Tomb of the Dragon Emperor feels hell-bent on convincing you that Brendan Fraser is 65 years old, this movie is determined to let you know that Tom Cruise is still, like, 35. Even though, I'm sorry, it just feels a little sad now. That's not to say I don't think Cruise can still be a really effective action star, but come on, you can't just fit him into a script where the lead is clearly intended to be, like, Michael B. Jordan's age. It feels off, and it doesn't let Cruz bring the kind of world-weary gravitas to the role that he has in those later Mission Impossible movies. It's also a film that falls into the exact trap that so many big wannabe franchise starters do these days. It seems far more interested in setting up its own sequels and spin-offs than doing anything remotely memorable. The comedy falls flat, the action doesn't embarrass itself, but... It's not really great. And to top it all off, you have Russell Crowe as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde feeling like he's sleepwalking through an entirely different movie than the one you're actually watching. And I say that as someone who loves Russell Crowe. Like, this is the star of Master and Commander The Far Side of the World I'm talking about here. I wish I could be happy when he shows up. By the end, I felt like I owed Dragon Emperor an apology, because that movie has far more charm than this. Something went terribly wrong. And the mummy rose again. Now the race is on. I don't know what's next for the mummy. Many fans online have lobbied for a fourth Rick O'Connell movie, but there's also the possibility of going back to the franchise's horror roots. Something more in the vein of the recent Invisible Man. I'm sure it'll re-emerge in some form eventually, but no matter what happens, we'll still have the 1999 movie. A film that just does so much right and features so many charming performances. It's a roller coaster of a movie in the most complimentary way that I can mean that. So maybe it's fitting that the sequel to it that I prefer is an actual roller coaster. Maybe in the end, that's actually a pretty solid legacy. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.